Hello students. Today we are still in chapter one looking at the five foundations of economics. So our first foundation was incentives and the second one was trade-offs and then we had opportunity costs. So we talked about those in the last episodes so now I'll move on to look at foundation number four which is marginal thinking. So by marginal thinking, we mean look at the costs and benefits of one additional unit. This is distinct from looking at the total costs and total benefits. Here is the standard example that makes that distinction very clear. You can think about the total value and the marginal value of water. Oh, so the paradox of how is water which is so important and necessary, at the same time, so cheap. We need water to live, so we should be willing to pay enormous amounts of money to buy water. Yet somehow water is very cheap or even given away for free at drinking fountains. So how is that possible? Well, it turns out, we'll see more about this later, for pricing, the relevant consideration is not the total benefit and total cost, rather prices depend upon marginal benefits and marginal costs. Now while water in total is very valuable because it's needed to live, the marginal value of water is quite low. If you already have enough water to take care of most of your basic essentials, the value of having one extra cup of water is pretty low. So maybe you could drink a little bit more water, but you already have enough to survive. So one extra glass, not going to make a big difference. So the marginal benefit of water is low. Marginal cost of getting water, also pretty low in most of the country. So collecting a little bit extra rainwater so it can be filtered and all that stuff, pretty easy to do. Thus, while water can be valuable, extremely valuable in total, its marginal cost, marginal benefits can be quite low, and consequently, something extremely valuable can be extremely cheap. So, this is important for avoiding some errors in analysis. You don't want to conflate total with marginal. So, I'll give you guys an example of some of that sloppy thinking to avoid. So, you might hear something like this. Education is vital for producing informed citizens and strengthening our democracy. It boosts productivity and expands opportunity. We need to increase funding for education. Now, this last argument here, increasing funding, actually does not follow from the earlier reasons. I'm not disputing these two earlier sentences, but the conclusion is not a logical consequence of them. Why is that? Well, our first couple of sentences here are about the total value of education. So we're saying education is a good thing overall. Gives informed citizens, productivity, all that kind of wonderful stuff. But whether you need to increase funding for it is a different question. Increased funding refers to not the total value of education, but rather to its marginal value. So yeah, overall education is a good thing, but does that necessarily need, mean you need more of it? By the same kind of logic, water is a good thing overall, but you don't necessarily need more water. You can have enough, you can also have too much of a good thing. So I'm not trying to say here that you can't make the case for raising education budgets. Rather, I'm saying that if you do want to make that argument, you got to do it in a different way. You got to do it in a way that's going to refer to the marginal benefits and the marginal cost of education. If you could say something like, for every one extra dollar we spend education, we get an extra two dollars of benefits to society, that's an argument you could make because that refers to the marginal benefits, that is the additional benefits being higher than the additional costs. So if you want to make that argument, you got to do it in the right way. Here's another illustration of marginal analysis. Let's say looking at hiring workers. So in an earlier episode, 
we had a business start by Robert, and he hired one of my star students, Joseph, to advise him. They do some math, and they work out this following table for their business. If you have no workers, that means you get no profit, but you also have no costs. So you get a zero here for profit. If you have one worker, you get a profit of five, and so on. So the total benefits here, the total profit the firm has, the marginal net benefits are how does that profit change when you add one more worker? So you can see the pattern here. If you go from zero workers to one, profit goes up by five. Zero plus five is five. If you have one worker, you have $5 in profit. If you hire a second, you'll have $8 in profit. That means your profit goes up by three. Five plus three is eight. Similarly, eight and two is 10 and so on. 10 minus one is nine. That's how this table is constructed. We'll see more examples of this later on. This is just a very um, brief introduction. So my question for you guys is how many workers should Robert and Joseph hire? So like I was saying before, I like giving you guys problems to solve in class. So go ahead and pause the video here, think about it, and once you have the answer, press play and we'll go over it together. So pause the video here. All right, I'll assume you have worked it out by now. So the optimal number of workers to hire is three. So you hire three workers, you get profit of 10. That's the biggest possible profit that the firm could get. So you could find just by looking at the profit column over here, there's an equivalent way to do it as well that focuses just on the marginal net benefits. So the rule is that whenever the marginal net benefits are negative, that's when you want to stop hiring. So if you have negative marginal net benefits, that means your profit goes down when you hire more workers. So marginal net benefits are negative for the fourth worker, so you don't want to hire a fourth worker. And likewise, you don't want to hire a fifth worker as well because negative marginal net benefits, that drags your profit down from nine to five. So you want to keep higher as long as the marginal net benefits are positive and stop when they're zero and definitely don't go into negative territory. So even if you couldn't see a second column here, if that was just deleted or something, you still work out the right answer just by looking at the marginal net benefits column. So higher until marginal net benefits are zero. That's the hiring rule. And we'll see more examples in future chapters of that. So you want to hire three workers. Now this also illustrates the point I was making on the earlier slide. Saying something is good is not the same as saying you need more of it. So if you have, let's say, three workers, then having workers is a good thing. Having workers gives you $10 in profits. That is not the same as saying you need more workers. So workers are good, but hiring more workers beyond that actually starts to reduce your profit. So don't conflate total and marginal. You can have too much of a good thing and saying something is good is not equivalent to saying you need more of it. They're different. All right, so that wraps up our fourth foundation on marginal thinking. Now I'll go and look at our fifth and final foundation, trade creates value. So I said at the beginning of the chapter, I don't really think this should be a separate foundation because it's really just so you can derive from the other four foundations. So um, it's not really independent, but we'll follow your textbook and treat it as a separate foundation. So one big myth to watch out for, trade is not zero sum. So a zero sum game is one where one player's gain is another player's loss. Games like games like poker are zero sum. In order for one player to win at poker, everybody else at the table has to lose. It's zero sum. Trade is not like that. Trade can benefit everyone involved. So we'll see several examples of that. We'll go more in depth in the next chapter. Here's an overview. So how is this possible? Well. Different people have different skills, so they have different opportunity costs for the same thing. 
Remember from before, we defined opportunity costs. Opportunity cost was the value of your next best option. We used the example of if you're going to college, what you could be doing instead is working full time. Therefore, your opportunity cost of going to college is the salary you could have earned from working. So different people have different things they could be doing instead, say different opportunity costs. So what people can do is specialize in areas where they have a low opportunity cost and they can trade for things that they're not quite so good at. They can trade for things that they can't do very efficiently. So if I'm really good at one thing, I'll focus on that. And if you're really good at something else, you can focus on that and then we'll trade and we'll both get better off. So here's an example. Let's say LW is someone who works in sales and she owns a house and she has a lawn. She could mow her own lawn if she wants to. It's definitely within her skill set, not very hard. However, if she spends an hour mowing her own lawn, that's an hour that's not being spent doing sales. Let's say, let's get some numbers in here. Let's say she gets $30 an hour from sales. So you might think if I mow my own lawn, it's free because I'm not paying anyone. Well, actually, you're giving up an hour of work, so you still have an opportunity cost. You're giving up $30 of money you could have been earning by working instead. Let's add another character to our story. So Sandra is a high school student, and she bags groceries at the local grocery store, and she's earning minimum wage. At the federal level, minimum wage is $7.25 per hour, though some states and some cities have higher ones. So let's go to the federal one. Let's say she's earning $7.25 an hour. So these two individuals here have different opportunity costs. So LW, if she wants to mow her own lawn, has to sacrifice an hour of sales and sacrifice $30 from doing that. If Sandra were to spend an hour mowing a lawn instead of bagging groceries, she's only sacrificing minimum wage. So they have different opportunity costs. So Sandra L has a lower opportunity cost and it's a chance to make a trade that's going to help out both of our characters. So let's say LW is going to offer Sandra 20 bucks to mow the lawn. Both people are going to be happy about this. So LW can do another hour of sales and earn $30 from that. So she's only paying $20 to earn 30. So LW is better off. LW is going to get a profit of 10 from this. Sandra is also happy about this arrangement. Typically when Sandra works an hour, she only gets $7.25. Now someone's going to pay her $20 for an hour of her labor. So she's happy about that too. So it's not the case that Sandra won and LW lost from trade because Sandra got paid. Actually, both sides were better off. This brings us to a very, very important idea. We'll hear a lot about this in the next chapter and also later on in the course. So the definition is comparative advantage. That is not a typo. Some people sometimes say competitive advantage, but that is not the same thing. I do really mean comparative, not competitive advantage. So comparative advantage is when one person or a country or a business has a lower opportunity cost than someone else. So another question for you guys to think about before moving on to the next slide. In our example with LW and Sandra, who has the comparative advantage in mowing lawns? So go ahead and pause the video here. And once you think you figure it out, press play. All right, I'll assume you have worked it out by now. So for mowing the lawns, we said LW has to sacrifice $30 per hour from doing sales. So that's LW's opportunity cost. So LW's opportunity cost is $30. Sandra gives up minimum wage, which is $7.25. So Sandra's opportunity cost is 
725 is less than 30, so Sandra's opportunity cost is lower than LW's. The person with the low opportunity cost, in this case Sandra, has a compare advantage, so the correct answer is Sandra. So again, we'll go in more depth in the next chapter about trade creates value. I'll just leave you with one final example that really drives home the importance of trade. So a number of books and movies are premised on the main character being stuck on some desert island. They'll try to live off their wits and find a way to survive. And we'll think about here, what is the, what's wrong with being stuck on a desert island? What makes that so difficult? Well, you've not, you haven't lost any of your skills or abilities. You still know all the same things you knew before. So that's not the issue. What you probably might have said before this class is that if I were stuck on a desert island, the big problem would be I don't really know much about how to hunt. I don't know how to forage for food. I don't know which plants are safe to eat, which ones are dangerous. So that's what's so bad about being stuck on a desert island. To which I would reply, well, you don't know that stuff right now, but somehow you've gotten to, to survive reasonably well in modern society. So you don't have those skills, but that's not hurting you in modern society. Why is that? Well, I don't know how to hunt, but I can trade with people who do. I don't know how to raise cattle, but I can trade with people who do. I don't know how to farm, but I can trade with people who know how to farm. So this lack of knowledge is actually not especially essential if you can trade. So the real problem you face with being stuck on a desert island is that you have no one to trade with. You can't trade with the farmer. You can't trade with the cattle rancher. And that's why things are so hard. You have to do everything yourself and you can't focus on your strengths. You can't focus on your comparative advantages and enjoy the benefits of trade. So that wraps up chapter one on our five foundations. Be sure to join us for chapter two and we'll learn more about trade.